Hey there everyone, my name's Jenny. Welcome to Bear Creek AG's online service and thanks so much for being here. We wanted to take a few minutes and share a couple of things with you and your family, so check this out. If this is your first time joining us online today, we want you to know we are so glad to have you here. For us, church is so much more than just a Sunday service and we want you to know that there's a place that's perfect for you at Bear Creek and one of the best ways to get connected with us online is to let us know that you are here. So please make sure to comment below. We have some exciting things coming to Facebook soon so that we can connect with you even better. Please stay tuned for more information. We are now offering Brother Glenn's Sunday School class on Wednesday nights. This past week, he began a study on the book Whisper by Mark Batterson. This study will be every Wednesday night at 6.30 p.m. and is open for all adults that are interested. A video will be posted of that week's study on Sunday mornings in the Sunday School group on Facebook in case you miss a week. If you have any questions, you can contact Brother Glenn for more information. We are partnering with Mercy Chefs to distribute free fresh food every Monday from 3 to 4 p.m. here at the church. If you are interested in getting a box, all you have to do is drive through to our back doors under the awning and you will be loaded with a fresh food box. All boxes are first come, first serve. We love to celebrate around Bear Creek. Who doesn't love to celebrate, right? So on September 6th, Sunday, September 6th, we are going to have a huge celebration day and we want you all to be a part of this special day. We will celebrate with water baptisms, our missions team testimonies, and we will launch our brand new online campus. That's right. We are extending our reach out into our community and beyond with an online campus on Facebook. This online campus will enable us to have a greater connection with each other throughout the week, as well as with our online community that watches every Sunday morning. Stay tuned for more information in the weeks to come and how you can be a part of our new campus. Don't forget to check in with us in the comments so we know that you are watching today. We look forward to seeing all of your smiling faces pop up online. If you have a prayer need, please comment below or private message us. We would love to agree with you in prayer today. We will join Pastor Tony as he continues his series, Fruit of the Spirit. Today, he will be talking about the fruit of the Spirit, love. We believe God has something unique to say to you, and our hope is that you feel his love stronger today than ever before. And now, here's Pastor Tony with today's message. I want to welcome everybody once again to Bear Creek Assembly of God. I see some new faces, uh, some faces maybe you've been here before, but I wasn't here um, on some kind of crazy mission trip to the mountains. Everybody says, mission trip to the mountains? That's the kind of mission trip I want to go on. Go with me next time. <laughs> I'm still walking around gimpy with a, uh, a hurt back, but you know, it's just so nice to see everybody here. And, and I want to take this moment to greet all those online. We here in the, in the physical building sometimes forget that we've got a congregation just as big here that's watching online. Matter of fact, will you guys help me welcome those this morning? Come on, let's welcome this morning. We're glad that you are here with us online this morning. And I just want to address those online for just a moment. I want to make an announcement to you guys online. I know that some of you have been asking where's the worship and the praise. And, and I promise you it's our intent to put that online with the message very soon. The issues that we're having is the quality you hear here may not be the quality you hear there. And we want to make sure that everything that we're putting out there is done with excellence to the glory of God. But we're working on it. Stay tuned and hang on because I promise you very soon you will be able to encounter what we have encountered this morning in the presence of our Lord and Savior through us lifting up our praise and our worship. Amen. Something about when you make a sacrifice of the Lord, He blesses us. It's amazing how good our Heavenly Father is. Well, before we enter into the message this morning, I, I want to take time to pray for our teachers. Um, there is a lot of, and we'll pray for the students when they go back to school. They've been delayed, you sorry rats, get to take a couple more weeks off before going back. But our teachers, praise God, have had to report. Thank you, Jesus. 
you don't know, my wife is a teacher. No, I'm joking. She didn't see her go back. It's been really pleasant having her around a little bit longer this summer. But uh, my projects are almost done at the house, so I'm kind of ready for her to get out of the house so I can have a break for a change. But I do. There's a lot of anxiety that's going on right now in, in our educational fields because our administrator, educators, eat the parents, lunch, of those who serve our children, bus drivers. There's a lot of anxiety because of COVID-19. And I understand that. And regardless of which side of the aisle you stand on, where you say, ah, it's just blown out of proportion, or man, I am scared to death by it. Well, let's, let's kind of come to the middle and understand that the reality of it is our teachers and educators, because of it, whether they're concerned about catching COVID-19, some of them are, but some of them, it's just the challenges they have to go through to even teach those precious little ones that we're sending back to them. <laughs> and those precious big ones as well. And so this morning, I just, I just want to pray over uh, all those who are part of our educational system here in Bay County. And anyone that may be watching online, that uh, obviously we got people who are watching from Arizona, and we had some from Michigan, we've had some from Pennsylvania. So wherever you may be, if you are an educator, we want to pray for you because... I don't want you walking in fear, first of all. God didn't give us a spirit of fear. He gave us a spirit of, look, you need to be cautious. The eye is hot. Don't touch it. The snake is poisonous. Don't, don't play with right? Come on. But he didn't give you the fear that you are grasped in fear. And the second thing is, we know you're serious about what you do. And, the, and when it complicates it, it's, it's frustrating. I couldn't get up here and preach with a mask on. I know y'all like for me to cover up, cover up this mug. I know, I know. But I, it would not be as effective. And so part of that, and how do you teach someone online while teaching, it, it's, it's a challenge. So this morning, if you're part of the educational system, whether you're a driver, a mechanic, whether you're a teacher, a pair, you work in the lunchroom, you're whatever, you may be a volunteer in a classroom, I want you to stand this morning. I want you to stand. If your family is with you, obviously... It, I want them to stand with you, and I want your family members to lay hands on you. And we're going to pray a prayer of blessing over you and a prayer of peace. Father, uh, Lord, you are all about education. When Jesus came, he came to educate us. He came to take what man believed about you, Father, and how to honor you and live for you. And he many times said, you've heard it said, and then he shared what it was really supposed to be like, God. Your heart is at Put it another way, Father, about making disciples, people following you, Lord. And these educators, these who are supporting the educator, even our, our, our board and our superintendent, Father. God, I pray that you give these men and women the wisdom they need to make the right, informed, educated decisions. Father, to keep our teachers and our educators and faculty members safe, first and foremost, God. We want them safe, but God, we also want an environment where the students can learn and the teachers, God, could express, Father, the things that they need to, God, for the future of these students, Lord. And I pray that today, God, that you somehow, some way, God, that you just protect them. Lord, anoint those classrooms. Anoint them, Father. Let your Holy Spirit, God, do hover over and in them, Lord. Let these educators, Father, may as the temple of the Holy Spirit, bring your presence into their rooms, onto those campuses, God, wherever they may go, Lord, and may your presence, the Holy Spirit, Father, cleanse those places, protect them from it, Lord, the students as well, God, and Lord, just help them be innovative in the way they teach. God, give them, give these teachers the ideas, the ways, the means of, of educating. See, Lord, those who are, God, overwhelmed with technology, and, and maybe they're not comfortable with it, Lord, remind them that they can do all things through you, Jesus, because you are their strength. God, your word says that they lack wisdom to ask, and you freely give. Give them the wisdom, God. Give them the self-confidence, Lord, not as educators, but, Lord, as children of the Most High God, to be able to do what they need to do, Lord, so that these students, God, can realize their dreams, God, what you have laid out, God, what you have laid out for them, Father. And I thank you in advance for this in the wonderful name of Jesus, our oh God, your strong son. Amen and amen. God bless you, teachers. And man, at one time I thought I wanted to be a teacher. Hard enough being a pastor. I don't know if I could be a teacher too. Amen. You are honored, though. You're, you're, you are servants. You have servant hearts to do that, and I appreciate that. Uh, before we go, if you would, go ahead and turn to your Bibles to Galatians chapter 5. And as you do, some announcements. I usually don't take time to do this, but they didn't make it into it on my part, not Miss Jenny's part. And just one of uh, two very important 
uh, announced. First of all, all you all that are part of Brother Glenn's Sunday school class, we know with COVID-19 we've not been able to have Sunday school because we don't want to have double exposures to rooms. And you may be wondering why. Not we're going away from Sunday school or small groups or Christian education is very important, but because we don't want to cross-contaminate from Sunday school in all of our buildings and in the rooms. So what we've been doing is he's been teaching his class online. Well, we have made the decision that he will now be teaching his class live and in person on Wednesday nights. Amen. And if you're not part of his class, you can come on Wednesday nights. He's got a great book uh, that he is teaching out of right now. And we will be, uh, bless you. We will be, uh, it's my wife, she's got a, she doesn't have COVID-19. She's got allergies. So it's all the projects you have me doing at home. Um, God bless her. 33 years of marriage yesterday. I don't know how God gave her the strength. But anyway, she has. She's made it this far. But with that, we'll also be recording it so that it can be shown on Sunday mornings at the normal time. Okay, so if you if you're watching online because he has a following online that's unbelievable. And so I know you can't drive from Arizona and Pennsylvania or wherever else you may be watching from. Timbuktu, but you can still watch online on Sunday mornings at the normal time. But we just felt like that. It was, I felt like, God just laid it on my heart last week, and I, I said, Lord, let him be the answer. If he says yes, we'll do it. So he'll be teaching his class here on Wednesday night. That doesn't mean if you're not part of his class, you can't come. He's just going to be the guest teacher on Wednesday nights. And I'm looking forward to, to, to sitting under his teaching uh, for at least a week. We'll see how it goes after that. So <laughs> another, another announcement real quick is, uh, with, and I put this on Facebook, but a lot of, some of y'all, a lot of y'all don't do Facebook, I know. Uh, I don't do Facebook, but um, I, I don't solicit volunteers from the platform. I, I don't believe it's necessarily, it's not that it's wrong, it's just not been part of my DNA. I've never been that way. I feel like God leads you to help or God will lead me to ask you to help, and I've, and I've always been that way. But with COVID-19, the challenge is one of our vital ministries is lacking personnel because many of the personnel that's in this particular ministry have pre-existing health conditions, or they, work, they have someone in their home that is elderly, and they cannot afford to be exposed to the virus. And we're doing everything we can here to keep you safe. This place, twice a week, before Wednesday and before Sunday, we have a fogger. His name is Danny McMines, and he comes in here with this fogger, and he, he disinfects everything in this church so that you're safe. Uh, But we do know sometimes people unawarely could bring it. So those folks have had to step down. And we are in dire straits for just some men and some women to step up and work in our toddler class. This is not a permanent commitment. This is just until COVID-19 goes away and these couples can get back involved with that ministry. They've had to step away. And I respect that. I respect it wholeheartedly. They need to if they they can easily... uh, catch COVID and it's not something they think to take home with them. So I'm just asking you to not pray about it, not to think about it. Uh, If I had four people stepped up and said, you know, Pastor, I can do it once a month, one Sunday a month, I would be grateful for that. Please see me after the service, okay? We have to do our vetting. We do background checks on everybody. And uh, so we want to make sure if you're not already in our volunteer system that we do what we need to do uh, for for your safety, but also for the safety of our children. Okay. Yes, ma'am. That's our three- and four-year-olds, and they are precious. They really are. And we have young couples that come to our church that's, that won't come if we don't have this class because one is they don't want to be a distraction in our service. And I get it. They don't want to distract you. And then they don't want to be distracted. And you say, well, why don't they have the class? Well, because they're with their toddler every day of every week. And so we want to give them, and some of them do, believe it or not, but we want to give them the opportunity to be in service. We have some new couples that are coming. All right, and so we need to do that. So please, you hear my you hear my heart, right? Remember, why do we exist? We don't. The church doesn't exist for you. I know I'm not even to my message yet. I'll, I'll cut. I'll cut some stuff out. I feel I need to share. This church doesn't exist for you. What? Oh, pastor, that hurt. What do you mean? This church exists for the lost. This church exists to find people and then build disciples. That toddler class is building disciples. You show the love of Christ as this precious three- and four-year-old, but in the same time, those parents who come in through these doors can also hear the gospel, and if they're not saved, be reached, and then become part of the discipleship process. It is here to build you as a disciple, but I guarantee you, if I took a, if I took a survey right now as I look at con- congregation, those that I know, 
most of you say, well, I'm a mature, bro- a mature brother, a Christian in Christ, right? A sister in Christ. I'm mature. I've been saved a long time. I know the word. Then you need to be a part of the discipleship process of discipling others. Because what's the mark of a mature Christian? A discipler. Someone who disciples others. Fruit. Oh, I want to get down, but my cameraman would get mad at me. I feel like I just got to cash some vision. This church, this building, this body, it is here for the edification. But understand, we are to reach the lost and then develop them into disciples. That's why I stopped. I want to explain that song because it's so powerful. We're moving. If you don't understand that song and we're sitting in here, we're jumping and screaming, you're thinking, man, they're fanaticals. Well, we are. We're fanaticals. We're a little bit crazy about Jesus. Absolutely. Because of what that song means. They may not understand. Hallelujah. They may not understand. The, the ground shook. There was an earthquake. Amen. It was. The rock rolled away and Jesus came out of the grave alive. Hallelujah. The first fruits. Even that term, first refresh, he was the first one to be resurrected. Others had come back to life, but he would never die again. Lazarus died again. Uh, that's a teaching, preaching for another time. So I say that once again. We're here to help people discover God, or actually to, to meet God, to find the freedom in their life that God wants them to have, to discover their purpose. Why did God create me and then make a difference? Some of you... Know God. Some of you have been set free. Some of you, if you don't know what your purpose is, is to work in the toddler class. Now, go make a difference. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. That's good preaching. I don't care what you say right there. All right. That's good preaching. Some of y'all like it. The rest of y'all I'm praying for. Okay. Um, I, I, I've seen some folks in here that have never, I don't recognize their faces. They're probably saying, what? Who is this crazy guy? Hi, my name's Tony, and I'm the pastor. Amen. <clears throat> Excuse me. Well, we're about to get to Galatians chapter 5, but before we do, I want to, I want to share a dream I had last night. Yeah, I, yeah. Some of y'all know what's coming. I had a dream. I had a dream last night that I was taken into heaven, and Gabriel, the archangel Gabriel, was taking me down the hallways and giving me a tour of heaven. And, and down the hallway, I noticed on the wall were these clocks. And under each clock had a person's name. It was it was really interesting as I looked at it. But I noticed that the clocks were all keeping time at a different pace. In other words, where one may say 12 o'clock, the other one, the, it would be moving quicker and it may be 1230. Another one would be 1 or 159, whatever. You know, it's just different. Every time I thought, man, that's, that's really odd and got my curiosity. But I was just overwhelmed by the beauty, even the hallways of heaven. And then we came to a spot where I saw a name tag of someone I knew. But the clock was missing. I said, Lord, what, what happened to Glenn Hood's clock? <laughs> I was so concerned. I said, God, what happened to Glenn Hood? He says, well, here, Tony, come with me and I'll show you. He took me down this very secluded hallway down and it was bright. It was the, the prettiest hallway of all. And it led to these big old, these big doors that were made out of pearl. Gorgeous. And he opened them up and I looked and I knew where I was at. I wasn't in the throne room of God. I was in the office of God. He had his own office. And I walk in there and I look and I'm looking and, and I said, but wait a minute, Gabriel, I don't see the clock. He says, look up. And I looked up and there his clock, Glenn's clock, and it was going so fast. I said, what's that about? He said, God needed a ceiling fan. <laughs> now, what I did was I left part of it out. That was supposed to indicate how much you sin. <laughs> Sorry, brother. I blew my joke. But anyways, I love you, my friend. I love you, my friend. Well... Let's look at Galatians chapter 5. I began the series last week, and uh, not to repeat everything I said last week, but for the foundational purpose. I know some of y'all weren't here last week, and just want to set the foundation for this. I kind of already have, in the sense I told you what the church exists for. We're, we're here to reach the lost, and we're here to make disciples. Uh, part of that is the fact that the way God created the world and the way He created us, His purpose and His plan was always for Him to present His existence through the church. It is through the church that He wants to, I want to use a churchy term, He wants to manifest His presence. 
It's through the church, the big C, the little C, and you as a temple, the Holy Spirit. If you save, the Bible says you become a temple. The Holy Spirit dwells within you. He's always planned that through a Christian's life, through the church, through the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, that he would present his presence to a dying world. You with me? It's through you. He wants... Your friends, your co-workers, the people you are at an intersection with or you're going, someone going down the wrong way at Walmart in the aisles, it's to those people God wants you to present His presence to. And since that's true, since God is building a temple, a person, that we are to reflect His glory. We're to, we're to reflect His goodness I'm trying to use terms that, 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 that we can grasp. When we, we are to reflect, today we're going to talk about His love. His love. What, 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 whatever that is. He wants this body, you and I, us as a church, we are to reflect that majesty of who He is. And He wants to do it within the framework that the things that you see outside of your life, the things you see outside of the church, the things you see outside of culture are totally different than what you see in you or in the church. For example, right now in the United States, we see a lot of racial tension going on. We see a lot of political tension going on. We see a lot of fear-mongering going on with COVID-19. We see a lot of we see a lot of financial fear going on. And what God's intention is, all those things that exist out there are not to exist in here. Are you with me? That's God's intent. God's intent is that when you step inside this church, there is no racial differences. Got a few of you amen to me. The rest of y'all, I'm just praying for you, right? When you step inside this church, I don't care what your political affiliation is. I almost don't care what football team you root for, but I'm getting there. You, you see what I'm saying? So when, when someone steps into this church or someone steps into your life, when the Holy Spirit leads you and causes your path to cross with somebody else who is unchurched or maybe has the wrong idea about church, that they see a difference. And the question is this. If it is illegal in our nation, if it was illegal in our nation... For us to change the cultural norms of our culture. If the government investigated, would they find us guilty of being different than the culture? Is, see, see what I'm saying? If they were to come in here today and investigate, would they say there is no racial tension in here? Would they say there's no political divide in here? Would, would they say there's no fear in here? Would they say there is a love that's different in here than there is out there? Would, would, would they be able to make a case, or in your life, personally, and would they be able to throw you in jail for, for breaking the norms of society? Right? I, I want you to, I hope, like, I pose that to you, and I hope those that were here went home and really asked yourself that question, because I don't want you to come to church today to get your Jesus card punched, or any week. I don't want you to come here today or any week and say, I've been to church and you just do a check mark and I'm done. I don't want you to come here today and say, service starts at 1030, so I'm going to show up at 1040. And it's over at 1230 or whenever the Holy Spirit decides it's over. And I'm going to leave at 12, whatever the case. I want you to come today believing that you're not hearing me, but you're hearing the heart of God every week. I try not to impose my opinion. Because when I ask you to ask this question, I have to have already asked myself this question. And it's a hard pill to swallow sometimes. But it's a question we must have. It's not can the church or you articulate the gospel. It's not can you defend the gospel. The question is, are you being the gospel? See... Are you a message that people will listen to or see and say, I want to be like Mike. 
I want to be like that person. What is there? Do you give off a fragrance? I used that term last week. That an aroma with your life, with your words, your actions, your thoughts, that would catch the attention of somebody who doesn't believe like you, or think like you, or act like you? It's a tough question. We have to. Because it's God's desire to change the world by manifesting or presenting himself through us. It's his plan for our lost world to see his plan for their life, to see the gospel, the good news, that their lives can be different, that they can have a future in him here on earth and into eternity. That is his purpose for you and I. And because of that, we see no better picture of what that person should look like, you and I, than in Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. So follow along with me. I will be back in at the verse 16 because Paul has given you, as often he does, this is the way it shouldn't be, and this is the way it should be. So as I read this, I want you to ask yourself, is this me? Now Paul starts off with some pretty strong Things you shouldn't be. And we'd call and say, well, I'm not that. I'm not that. But then he gets to some things that, hmm. But then he transitions to what the Spirit wants to develop in us. So let's begin verse 16. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. So there's a war going on. For these are opposed to each other. So the godly things are opposed to the fleshly things. The things your flesh wants to do. The things that you desire to do that aren't godly. To keep you from doing the things you want to do. Remember Paul says, oh, what a wretched man I am. The things I don't want to do are the very things I do. The things I do are the things I don't want to do. Oh, what a wretched man I am. It's a battle that's going on. But if you're led, here's the key, led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident. These are evidence, are evident evidence of you are walking in the flesh. Sexual immorality. Most of us say, ah, that ain't me. Impurity, that ain't me. Sensuality, that ain't me. Idolatry, putting something before God. Biggest God today is self. I'm not preaching there, but I'm going on. Sorceries, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger. Oh, boy. Go down 231. Never mind. Rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. He said, this is, this is not an exhaustive list. It's anything in those categories. This, this is walking in the flesh. This is opposed to walking in the spirit. All right, And he goes on to say, um, I warned you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Who's he speaking to here? The Galatian church. Christians. He's speaking to them. You do those, okay? This is not a, this is not a harsh message today. This is, this is a message of love. But we have to see what we're not supposed to be like. We're supposed to be the opposite of that. We're not supposed to be like the world. We're to manifest the presence of God. Well, what does that look like? 22. But the fruit of the Spirit, when you're led by the Spirit, if I inject that, I may inject that is love, is joy, is peace, is patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there is no law. I was joking about the courts coming in and law getting you. See, there's no law against that, at least not yet. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Doesn't verse 22 and 23 sound like someone you want to hang out with? Ask my wife. She hangs out with me every day. (laughs) And she'll tell you I'm not anything close. No, I'm not that, but I'm working on it. Right? I mean, that was Jesus. When you read the Gospels and you see what he's done for you, he's definitely all of those attributes, all those identifiers. He is love. He is joy. He is peace. He is long That That's who he was. That's who he desires us to be, be Christ-like. People you want to hang out with. I want to hang out with that person, see. Remember, I said this last week. The Spirit has to produce the fruit. You can't produce this. But why does He produce this fruit in you? It's not for you. We forget that sometimes, church. It's not for you. He wants to produce that in you for those who are in your life. It might be your wife. It might be for your co-worker. 
This is God desiring through His Spirit to produce something, and we are producing something one way or another that will reflect he a great, luscious, beautiful steak. I don't anymore. <laughs> Could, I said. I have. And they'll go and get ketchup, and they will cover it, smother it, pour out on it, lavish it with ketchup. You know those kind of people? we got a small group we're starting for y'all. Hi, I'm a ketchup abuser, and my name is Tony. That's the picture, that's the image of what God does. He has outpour, the, the outpour of God's love is, is the story of the Bible. Think about the story of the Bible. It's about God's love for us. The very nature of God himself is love. You have, who is God? What is it? God is love. We say that a lot. And this has given us the image of what that is. God is love and is evident through his giving of his only son. We know that. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, mankind, men and women, boys and girls, people of all ages, creeds, colors, and heights, sweetheart. Even the short people. He loved you so much he sent Christ, his son, his only son, to die for you. That is the gospel in miniature. That is the active this or the activity of God's love. It is a verb, it's not a noun. It's what he is, but what he does as well. He is saturated with love. Now, if we're honest with ourselves, when we think about loving others, more often than not, our expression of love are, are, are related to what we benefit. From that love, or what we benefit, or if the person is worthy of it. For an instance, we have a tendency to love people based on what we can get from them. Does that make sense? Sometimes the physical attraction to, to someone of the opposite sex is based on, oh, look, and then all of a sudden you start showing signs of affection towards them based on what? You want their affection. Back. Or I'm going to go help this person, that person, because I know next week they've got a trailer I need to borrow. So I'm going to show my love for them by going and helping them do so. Right? You hear my heart. So often our love is expressed as it's based on condition. But the love of God is not based on condition. God's love is not based on anything you, or ha you have or haven't done. If you're in the hearing of my voice today and you have not received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, that doesn't change His love for you. While I was yet a sinner, Christ died for me. Before I was born and God knew I'd be born into this nature of sin, of wanting to follow after my desires and not God's desires, he sent his son to die for me. He sent his son to die for every person knowing that many would reject his love. But it didn't stop him. It didn't stop him. He still put things into motion. So think about the things that mark division among people in our culture, our society today, our community. That are directly related to status. Now, we obviously know that one thing that we're facing right now is, is the race issue. It's been brought to the forefront, needs to be. There's still racism in America. But outside of that, there's discrimination based on gender. Are you man or woman? Come on. Th think about social status. How, what's your income? What neighborhood do you live in? What kind of car do you drive? I'm hoping one day to get a Jeep, a camouflage Jeep. I've been promised a Jeep. Haven't seen it yet. If I can get my wife in it, I mean physically in it first, but then emotionally to want to get in it, I'm going to take a picture because she's like, I'm not driving around in a camouflage Jeep. She's discriminated against me by my likes. We're in the country, and camouflage is a dress code. It is, it is, it is dressing up. Depends on whether it's long sleeve, short sleeve, or what have you. It's, she calls it jalopy. Quit. We also discriminate by education. I could keep going. But the question is, is there a place where those things are dismantled and neutralized? Is there a place where those things don't matter? And I'm telling you emphatically, yes. Where is it at? In the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. In your life. Whether you're in this building or you're out there by yourself. If you're a child of God. If you're the temple of the Holy Spirit. These things should not exist in your life. And those who come around you should see the difference in you and say, what is different about you? That's the love of God, and that's the love that God wants to develop within us. It's a supernatural love that flows through us, and it should be both Godward 
and man word. Now, we pretty much get it pretty good on God word. When you realize what God's done for you, you get it right. You're like, man, God, I know I'm, I'm a heathen. Not my words, my wife's words about me. <laughs> I'm a heathen. <laughs> so I know my need for you, God. And, and, I, and my love and adoration, I appreciate you. But then that should be reflected in how I live my life and allowing the Holy Spirit to develop the fruit, the fruit of His Spirit within me so that now I reflect that love not only upward, think of the cross, but also horizontally. See? That's the kind of love that God wants to produce in us. Matter of fact, Jesus said that it is a summation of the great commandment. Our love for our fellow man is the validation of our expressed love for God. Jesus said in in, in giving the great commandment, love the Lord your God. And then love your neighbor as yourself. And he's actually saying there that the validation of how we love God is seen in how we love each other. I guess I need to go apologize to some crazy folks on 23rd Street from yesterday, don't I? Yeah, how you love, how you treat others is a reflection of truly how you love God. Whew, that's tough, isn't it? That's, that's, a, that's a tough, I'm being purposely slow today because I want this to sink in because I'm never going to, you're never going to have the joy of the Lord. And you're never going to have the peace of the Lord. And you're never going to have patience unless you get this one. This is the foundation For everything else that flows out of you as a believer in Christ. The validation of a true Christian experience is seen every day in how you interact with the world around you. John says that anyone who does not love his brother who who he has seen cannot love God who he hasn't seen. That's in 1 John 4.20. And then he goes on to say this in verse 21. And this commandment we have from him. Whoever loves God must also love himself. Mm Hmm. Love others. Love his brother. There is no middle ground in this perspective, this place that we're to be in. Either you love or you don't. So let's look at this. So what is this love that is both Godward and manward? What does it look like? There's a couple characteristics. Real briefly, I want to give you. First of all, this love takes the initiative. When you love with the love of God, when the Holy Spirit has produced this love in you, guess what? Then you take the initiative. You don't wait for someone else to take the initiative. You take the initiative to express this love. You see a need, you express this love. You're in an argument with somebody, you go and you, you be the more mature brother and you make things right. It's an initiative. It's what you do first. It makes the first move. Regardless of what has been done to you or how you've been ignored. In fact, this is a great sign whether God's love's in you. Can you do that? This love does not ignore the needs. It cannot ignore the needs of a brother. First John 3, 17. But if anyone has this, the world's goods, and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God love abide in him? If you have something and your brother needs it, give it to him. I need an excavator right now, by the way. No, no. It says give it to him. Help them, right? It, that, little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. And hasn't that been the complaint of the world against the church for centuries? We just talk a big talk, but we don't, draw, we don't walk a very big walk. It's been a lot of lip service. It's been a lot of theory. Well, it's time to take the Bible, which is not theory, it's truth. It is time to apply it and look through the world through the lens of the word of God and live it to the fullest. Doesn't ignore the needs of others. This love forgives. It takes the initiative. It doesn't ignore the needs of others. And it forgives. I don't, with or without an apology, by the way. I, I, there, it's amazing to me how many Christians I have talked to when there's, there's conflict in their lives and, and they're bound, they're, they're, they're actually the trap, and they're trapped in this un, state of unforgiveness and they're miserable. I've said this before. It's like you, you, you're just so offended by somebody that you, you, you think by drinking the poison of unforgiveness, you're killing that person. 
In reality, it's a cancer within you. Unforgiveness is, the, is, the, is, the, is a trick, it's a trap of the enemy. Unforgiveness is that part. If he could get you an unforgiveness, oh, not only will you not listen to the word of God, because some of you right now have just shut me down because I said you've got to forgive first. Will you just be open to this for a minute? It doesn't matter what they've done to you. I've heard it even from people who aren't believers in Christ. You heard it who have been, who have been abused terribly say that they forgave the person. Why? I had to forgive them for my peace. These are people in the world that don't even understand it, but it's a biblical principle that we are to forgive first. And I've heard people that are miserable inside, and, and they say, well, I will forgive them if. I'll forgive them provided that. When he or she comes to me first. And see, if you feel that way, then you have to ask yourself if you understand the love and forgiveness that God has for you. It's really, that's the basis of it. You have to understand what God has done for you. Learn to forgive. And there is scripture to support this. You have to forgive. You initiate it. Help your brother in need. Learn to forgive. This fourth thing is, is that the love is not so much a question of our feelings, but a matter of our will and action. Love is a decision. Love is a decision. If you're going to base it on your feelings, then you're going to, when you feel like loving somebody, that's when you love them. When you don't, you won't. But can I tell you something? Your feelings will lead you astray. If you live your life based on your feelings, you're going to be an emotional basket case. Don't base your love for others on, on feelings, because trust me, they're going to do things that you aren't going to like. It. If I based it on feelings, I wouldn't love any of y'all. Good, I'm glad you're laughing, because that was only about 75% of y'all. That was a joke as well. Yeah, but it's a decision that we have to make. Love is also, it has to be a priority. It's a priority of a Christian life. What is probably the greatest text in the Bible, many of you have had it in your weddings, and it's not a wedding text. Come on, you know where we're going. It's, not, it's okay to have it in your wedding, but 1 Corinthians 13 is not a wedding text. When you look at 1 Corinthians 13, you've got to realize what is Paul dealing with. He's with, dealing with a dysfunctional church that's, that's arguing over which gifts should be present in the church and which is the greatest of it. And right in the middle of all this, uh, all this upheaval, it, doesn't that smell like a really a, a fragrant church you want to be a part of? They're fighting and biting, backbiting and arguing and fussing at each other. And Paul comes along and right in the middle of it, he gives one of the greatest dissertations on love. 1 Corinthians 13, 1 says, If I speak in tongues of men and angels, but have not love, I'm a noisy gong and a clanging cymbal. You ain't nothing but a bunch of noise. And I'm going to get on you Pentecostals for just a minute. How dare you come in here or go somewhere and speak in tongues and give prophecies, interpret and walk out and then talk to your wife or your children like they're dogs. Or go out here and talk something negative about people. we got to quit wearing this thing like it's a badge of honor and start letting the Holy Spirit who's within us and who has gifted us to, with gifts of, of, of great value. We have to value those and quit. We're giving God a black eye. You can't go out there and live like the world and then say, oh, I'm spirit. Well, you can say it, but that's part of the double speak that the world looks at. I'll tell you that if you're baptized in the... Matter of fact, I wanted to make the case, and, 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 I, and I, I don't say I couldn't, but it would take me several Sundays to make the case. I, I'm of the opinion, my opinion, my theology, not necessarily biblical theology, although I think it is, is you truly can't express the fruit of the Spirit unless you're baptized in the Holy Spirit. Paul was speaking to people who were expected to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. If you don't understand the difference between that, I'd be more than happy to explain that to you on the side. He's speaking to people he is expected to have not just been saved, but have already been baptized in the Holy Spirit. And he goes on. All right, I didn't, that, that wasn't even in my notes. All right. Uh, you can pay extra at the door. And if I have prophet, prophetic powers that understand all the mysteries and all the knowledge, and if I have all the faith so as to remove mountains but have not love, I'm nothing. If, I can, if God performs all these miracles through me, I, I don't have anything. If I give away all I have, if I, if I deliver up my body to be burned but have not love, what have I gained? Nothing. Nothing. 
That's a pretty eye-opening, isn't it? That's an eye-opening statement when you think about our lives and what we value. This love is not a human love. This love is not a man-made love. This love is a supernatural love that only comes out of a right relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, understanding what he's done and valuing, and then based on that, you make the decision to uh, love others. See? Well, you, you, you can't produce this love, you said, Pastor. No, but you can choose to love in this love based on what God has done for you. It is a choice. Trust me, my, my wife doesn't always love me in the, in, in, the, in the sense of a secular love. But she, what I mean is there's times she gets frustrated with me, but she still loves me with the love of Jesus. Come on, wives, you can relate to what I'm saying. <laughs> but she loves me. Why doesn't she leave me when I'm disrespectful to her? Now, I'm using an example. I'm never disrespectful to my wife. Why, does she, why doesn't she love me when she... De- why, <laughs> Brother Gerald, your wife's in here just... Mm. Right. <laughs> actually, I'm looking for Miss Pat. She's usually sitting with me. She may not actually be here this morning. Why does my, lo- why does my lo- wife stay with me and love me even when she, when she doesn't feel like loving me? Because she's a woman of God. She chooses to. And can I tell you, ladies, I know I look angelic in the, the, the perfect picture of what a husband should be like. Mm-mm. I just need to come to the altar now, don't I? But I'm telling you the truth. Yes, I'll take that blessing. Is there another? <laughs> Might need a bless, sir. Let me, let, me, let me try to bring this to an end. See, this love is not based on our temperament. This love is not... Achieved by going to some class or reading a book. I'm saying that won't help, but that's not how this is achieved. This love is the work of God in us. So does that mean we do nothing? Absolutely not. I'm, not, I'm just going to try to jump ahead here real quick. But Paul, Paul basically says that daily we are to work out our salvation. What does that really mean? Well, I won't break it all down, but basically daily we have to evaluate ourselves according to the Word of God. And based on that, we have to work out our salvation. And it's the same way with love. It's the making the decision every day. Prioritize love. Love like God, not based on conditions, see. And this isn't a marriage thing, but I'm I'm speaking to husbands and wives in here and any future husband or wife. If you'll learn to love your spouse or your future spouse based on this principle, I'm not going to tell you you have a perfect marriage, but you'll have a fulfilled marriage. When you stop looking at what you can get out of the relationship and what you can give to the relationship because you love that person with the love of God. It's there. It's there. It's that sacrificial love. we got to work it out daily. Paul tells us in Colossians 3.1, after talking about, just said about working out your salvation daily, he says this, If you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father. It's because of our identity in Christ that you now engage in this activity. We focus on what that is, being Christ-like. See, that's the whole purpose of the Holy Spirit, is to transform us. He's our leader. He's our comforter. He's our guide. He's our helper. All those words that describe the Holy Spirit. But he does all of that for our benefit. For what benefit? So that we will benefit others. What's that mean, Pastor? He wants to do that in us so that we can reflect the glory of God. He does that in all of us so we can be transformed into the image of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He does all that so that we can be attractive to people who are seeking something in their life that is missing. The transformational power of the Holy Spirit. And that's what he wants to do. We have to make this decision and engage in this activity. It involves taking off the old self, the flesh. Putting on the new self. The stuff mentioned in Galatians 5, the desires of the flesh, they go away. The works of the flesh, all those things. Sorceries, intimacy, strife, impurity, sensuality, fits of anger, jealousy. All those things go away. Why? Because no one... Who does these things as, as a habitual pattern will, will, will inherit the kingdom of God. He, he, Jesus has saved us and the Holy Spirit wants to transform us into the image of God's Son. For the purpose of reaching a lost world. You see, as my worship team 
comes back up. And you guys need to sing, um, be prepared, sing that second song, um, Build My Life. I was noticing as we sing in the, all the worship songs we sang today, <clears throat> the first two, all three were powerful. And I have to mention the third one because my wife was leading the sing on, so it was very powerful too. But in reality, all three of them pointed to something about the love of God. But that second one called Building My Life, the words were very powerful. And I want us, as they prepare to sing it, I want us to reflect on that song. Because, see, we grow in the Christian life by divine grace. Grace, the, un, un, the, the, the favor of God, the unmerited favor of God. That's what grace means. I, I'm trying to help those who may not fully understand the terminology. But we grow because of God's goodness. He desires us to grow. But it's also true that it's our duty to grow in that grace. There are things we must do for the fruit of the Spirit to grow. I cannot produce that love. I have to decide to love the way God. How do I know how God loves? Well, first of all, I reflect on my own life, what God's done for me. And I mentioned this last week. This sounds like things that the pastor says to keep his job. But I'm not saying this to keep my job. It's true. Because the way the Holy Spirit helps us to grow is through reading your word. You get a picture of God's love, right? Through prayer, humbling yourself, worshiping, coming to church. You can experience the presence of God at home, but I don't know if you can experience the way we experience it here together. There's something super, supernatural about the presence of God where two or three gather in His name. But not only that, you make a sacrifice. See, we don't sacrifice like in the Old Testament with an animal. What's our sacrifice today? Ourselves. And you make the sacrifice of, I could slept in this morning, but I'm going to go to church. I'm going to bathe. I'm going to dress up. Right? Come on. It's Sunday. And I'm going to go, and I'm going to, I'm, and I'm going to endure this pastor for a while. But I'm going to worship. The Word tells us about itself that it doesn't come back void. I believe every one of you that's been paying attention this morning has been blessed. Not because I'm some great uh, communicator of the word, but no, because the Holy Spirit is blessing his word today. And you're open. And you're receiving it today. Like I said, this isn't a brow-beating message. I'm just setting the facts of what God's expecting of us. And I'm just trying to show you, you cannot produce this fruit of love. But you can choose to love others the way God has loved you. And you can look at the Word. You can come to church and learn. You can be, be people of like precious faith and worship and feel His love. He has inhabited this place today. Why? Because He loves you. Daily devotions. Getting involved with ministry. Get plugged into a small group. All these things are going to help you in your love. Expressing your love to others. Growing that spiritual love for others. We do these things, the Holy Spirit can work to grow the fruit, but we also grow in grace when we use it. How do I know I have electricity in my house? There's two ways. And I found out both ways. One way is to turn a light switch on, the light comes on. The other way is I touch two wires one day. Yeah, that was not a smart thing. My brain cells are a terrible thing to waste. It was accidental. But it's by what? Turning the switch on is the best way to do it. And the lights come on. And we must choose to allow the Holy Spirit to work on us to develop this fruit. And then we must choose to be led of the Spirit and reflect His fruit. So next time someone cuts you off on 231, I know y'all aren't flicking birds at people because you're godly. But there's the Christian bird. What are you thinking? You're laughing because you've done it. And you've taken both hands off the wheel when you did it. What are you thinking? That's as bad as texting and driving. No, we, 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 we can't do that. We, we have to show the love and we just pray for them. God, help them before I kill them. No, bless them, Lord. Keep them safe. Be Christ's light. Be the manifestation, manifestation presence of God on earth. Be attractive fruit that gives off a pleasant fragrance. Last scripture. I ended with it last week and this is a time of reflection and I'm going to let you go. We're instructed by Paul in 2 Corinthians 13. He says this, verse 5. Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Or do you not realize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless indeed you fail to meet the test. 
What's the test? Realizing that Jesus is in you and then reflecting that Jesus is in you. That's the test. You go back and look at it in context. So as they sing this song, I know it's going to sound really strange for your pastor to tell you this. I don't want you to worship. You don't even have to sing. I don't really. What I want you to do is as they sing these words, I want you to examine yourself. It's healthy. That's why we give tests at school. That's why we give driver's tests. To see if you qualify. To see how you're doing. See how you're developing. I go to, I, I go to the doctor twice a year for physical. That's a test. They're blood work. Checking my weight. It's still there. So I want you to take a few moments and examine yourself. Where, now listen. This part of my message I took out, and I'm not putting it back in, but I have to say this. None of us have arrived. I know that. We're still human, but we can't use our humanity as an excuse for not developing. Fits of rain, anger, jealousy. Well, Pastor, I'm not a, 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 a you know, I, I don't go out and, and I'm not an adulterer and I'm, and I'm not a homosexual and I'm not, I'm not someone who kills people. And, and yeah, okay, maybe you're not those things. But do you stretch the truth? have anger issues do you have jealousy issues envy are you causing strife are you expressing the love of God to others through your life see how you rate just take a few moments and just evaluate your life and maybe just ask the Holy Spirit you may think you're doing good and I'm not here to question that then just ask the Holy Spirit illuminate my life right now and show me because, see, the test of whether you're growing is not whether you think you're growing. This is, a, this is a toughie because I used it last week. It is good. It's does your spouse see you're growing? Do your kids see that you're growing in God's love? Does the guy driving down 231 that you don't know? And you have a Bear Creek Assembly God bumper sticker on your car. Does, does he know that you love him? With, are you giving off a fragrance? Because, see... It doesn't matter what you think. What matters is what other people think and what God thinks. Test yourself. Evaluate. See how you score today. Amen? Let's ask the Holy Spirit to help us today. Thanks so much for being here online with us today. If today's message touched you and you haven't given your life to Jesus, we believe today is the day. All you have to do is pray. Admit to God that you have sinned. Believe that Jesus died for you and confess that Jesus is Lord of your life. If you prayed that prayer to God today, please reach out to us and let us know. We have some digital resources that we would love to send your way to help you and for us to be able to connect with you. Make sure to stay connected with us throughout the week on Facebook and Instagram. Make sure to like and subscribe and share our social media accounts. We believe that church is more than just a building or a Sunday experience. We look forward to connecting with you online and in person. Thanks again for being with us today.